Welcome to the Next Law Advanced Training, September 2023 edition. This is the first time we've run this course for the community. Um, so first thing I'd like to say is I would appreciate any feedback you have about the content or the pacing. Um, this is a, as the name suggests, an advanced uh, Nextflow tutorial, rather an intermediate advanced Nextflow workshop. Um, we're going to explore some of the more advanced features of Nextflow and particularly introducing a little bit of Groovy um, and how to use them to write efficient um, and scalable Nextflow pipelines. As the name suggests, this is not an introductory workshop. I do or rather we do assume uh, some basic familiar, familiarity with Nextflow. Uh, we're not going to cover all the basic concepts. And the other important thing to note from an advanced workshop is that Nextflow, uh, at its intermediate and advanced levels, there's a lot to cover. Um, and there'll be some things I'm sure that I'll cover here today over the next couple of days that will be not new to people. And for those people, I apologize in advance, but I've tried where I where possible to sort of dot in little groovy concepts or some advanced concepts. So even though you might be familiar with, for example, the map operator, we're going to try and introduce some interesting ways of dealing with closures. Um, so we hope that there'll be something for everyone in this workshop. Um, we'd love to hear feedback about how you found it, how you found the pacing and the content. Um, we'll be hanging around the next flow uh, community channel. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you there. The other thing to note is that if you're watching live, uh, there is a Slack channel in the NF Core Slack, all of, where everyone who is participating in this workshop live will be hanging out and asking questions. I strongly encourage you to uh, take advantage of that. Ask questions where possible. I'll be hanging around and some other volunteers will be hanging around in the Nextflow channel over the next couple of days. Um, we'd love to hear feedback. We'd love to see your questions. Um, and we'd love to see people answering each other's questions. This is a community event after all. So without further ado, let's get into it. So the materials for this event will be up at training.nextflow.io underneath this advanced training tab. The environment setup is just like the in, in the sort of fundamentals training. There are two ways of doing this. Um, the recommended way is probably via Gitpod. By this open and git pod link will uh, spin you up a virtual machine with all the materials you need for the workshop. You can, if you prefer, run it locally with the local installation of Java and Bash, but um, it's just so much easier and I'd strongly recommend you use the git pod environment. If you click this link, you'll be uh, directed to git pod uh, where you can open this particular uh, repository. You can either choose VS Code on a browser or desktop in this workshop, I'm going to be demoing using the desktop editor, but they'll both be the same experience. Um, the standard four cores, uh, eight gigs of RAM should be sufficient for most. Uh, if you just click continue, it's going to spin you up a workspace in which you can uh, get started and conduct the workshop. This will take about five minutes. So I'm going to pause for five minutes here um, and give us a little break to and an opportunity for everyone to get spun up. Uh, I'm going to give us a few extra minutes just so that people who are having difficulty can uh, post on Slack. Um, you will require a GitHub login, um, but once that sort of five or 10 minutes is up, uh, we'll get started. We'll see you there. This chapter is all about Nextflow operators. Um, it's not a comprehensive tour of all the next law operators. There are far too many to cover in a workshop of this length. But what I want to do is give us a tour of some of the more interesting or underutilized operators that are available in the next law ecosystem. And we're going to use those operators to talk a little bit about uh, Groovy and introduce some basic Groovy concepts. All right, enjoy. Welcome to our operator tour. The first thing I'm going to do is navigate to the directory for this chapter, which is CD advanced operators and have a little look around. And I see here we have a main.nf and a data directory. I'm going to open the main.nf in, uh, in code here and have a look around and see that this workflow is a very simple little workflow. It takes a channel of five integers and passes that channel into the map operator. And to that map operator, we've supplied a closure. Um, this closure is a very simple closure. I've described it here as a sort of canonical example. It's 
a closure that takes each element, which by default return, it takes the value it and multiplies it by itself. That will return a new channel from that operator map, which we passed to the view operator, which just takes the outputs of that, uh, the inputs of that uh, operator, and inputs to view, and uh, prints up to standard output. Let's have a look at what that looks like when we run it. And as expected, we returned the integers 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, which are the first five integers squared. Um, <clears throat> as I said, by default, each element being passed to the closure is given the name it, just for convenience sake, to save us having to describe and give it arguments to all closures. But if you want to be a little bit more descriptive, and you can give it a, a name. So with this stabby operator, I can use the same the same closure. So this will generate the same result. I can double check that with next load run. But note here that I've given this closure, the, rather the inputs to this closure, the arguments of the closure, a name. So each of these integers in turn will take the value num and then multiply it by itself. And the return value is the last, the last expression in this closure, which is this uh, num times num. Uh, so the square of the value, which is again piped to the view operator. If you find yourself um, defining a particularly useful closure and you find that in your workflow it's used many times and you'd like to have a single place where that's defined, you can actually name closures inside of uh, Groovy and uh, inside of Nextflow. So here I'm going to give this closure a name and I'm actually going to uh, give it a type as well. So Groovy is an optionally typed language. I mean, it operates on the JVM, which is uh, strongly typed. <clears throat> so it's possible to give these, um, these integers uh, a type. It's entirely optional. In a lot of cases, this is not necessary, but it can sometimes help with debugging. And I just want to make sure that um, everyone here attending the advanced workshop is aware that it's a possibility. So I'm going to give this num times num. So now I have this square closure. So now into the map operator, I'm going to pass the square closure as an argument. So here I'm taking the same channel of inter five integers, passing them to map, but now instead of defining the closure in line, I've defined it here on line one, passing it to map as an argument. Let's run that just to make sure that everything has everything is the same and hasn't changed. That's perfect. Great. Um, if you have defined a closure with name here, you can actually compose them together. So if I have my square, and let's say I need to, would like to do something else to these integers. So maybe um, add a value. So I'm going to define a new closure called add to. And I'm just going to add to to each element. And I can use this notation here, this greater than, greater than notation, which takes the outputs of square and then passes them to the add to. So composing these closures together. So this should change our result. And as expected, uh, instead of squared numbers, we have squared numbers plus two. So we've taken the channel of integers, passing through map, which then composes these two closures together. And the return value of the last closure, the add to, is the return value of the um, map operation, which is then piped to the view operator. So we could alternatively write this in next flow because we already have this idea of composing, composing closures inside of next flow. This will give us the same, the same value. So here we've taken the map operation and just passed each of those named closures through two concurrent or two serial map operations. Um, and this is sort of more interesting for those uh, inclined towards functional programming, but you can actually curry these. So let's say we take a closure called times n, which takes two arguments, a multiplier and some other value. Let's call it num. And that's called it. 
retain the same names as documentation. And so this closure takes two arguments, a multiplier and some value to be multiplied, and it multiplies these two things together. I can carry the functions, carry these closures, that is, take a new closure, which sets the first argument to be some specific value. So um, I'm going to make a times 10 closure, which equals times n dot curry 10. So this curry function basically takes the argument here and sets it to the first value here. And so what we return is essentially a new function, a new closure rather, that looks like this. So times 10, these two lines are equivalent. So this times 10 takes this closure with two arguments, and just sets the first value to be 10. So if we want to see that in operation, let's do that. So we're going to pass this named closure times 10, which is the result of the curry operation on this closure that takes two arguments and pass it through map. Perfect. So our integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 have been multiplied by 10 and returned the values 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Perfect. Let's move on to uh, the view operator. So again, this is a very commonly used operator, um, particularly helpful in debugging. Um, it's sort of like the print line equivalent of asynchronous next layer programming. Um, I've used the view already quite a bit here in the demonstration of operators. Um, I'm using it actually in every example, just to view the outputs of the pipeline of this sort of series of composed operators. Um, but, and this just takes the, the value and returns a string fired, like a stringy representation of each item in the channel. But we can customize the output if we'd like by supplying, again, a closure uh, to the operator. So here, uh, I'm going to keep this times 10 example, uh, and I'm going to pass it to view, but in this, time, this time, instead of just a default view, I'm going to pass it a closure. Um, and I'm going to print out a helpful or in sort of informative message. I'm going to say, I found it. Just an example. And so now instead of just the default uh, in string, string versions of those integers, I'm printing a string message, found 10, found 20, found 30, found 40, et cetera. We can do more interesting things if we're interested in exactly what sort of class um, uh, those items are. I can use this dollar sign um, curly braces notation to put any sort of arbitrary groovy in here. So here I'm calling the get class method on the, the operator. So this get class method is available for all objects in Groovy and returns the class of the object. So what sort of numbers are these? I can see here that they're java.lang.integer. So this is helpful for customizing the messages that are returned and printed to standard output by the view operator. So we've talked here about naming these closures, but I want to be very clear here that in almost all circumstances, um, it's better and more convenient to keep these things anonymous closures, that is, um, pass them in um, pass them in directly here. But um, there might be occasions, and considering this is an advanced workshop, there might be occasions where using those name closures um, is helpful. But in almost all Nextflow workflows, the map operation um, are going to be past closures directly like this. Perfect. All right. On to the next operator in our tour. Uh, the split CS feed operator is particularly useful uh, because a lot of bioinformatics, computation biology, a lot of sort of data processing and batch data processing workflows begin with some, or at least at some point in the workflow, we'll need to read some semi-structured data like a CSV or a TSV. A very common pattern is for the input to a workflow to be a sample sheet, a CSV or a TSV, which describes the samples or the inputs to the workflow, maybe like a sample ID, and then maybe some paths to some file, and optionally some metadata and some extra columns. 
So we're going to see some more complicated ways to manage that a little bit later in the work, workshop. Um, but the split CSV function is a really great, uh, handy little tool to have in your work belt. So I'm just going to copy this here. So let's have a look. What is this data sample sheet dot CSV? Oops. Perfect. So you have this little CSV here. Um, it has these five columns, an ID, a repeat, which is a piece of metadata, maybe a type, another piece of metadata, which is tumor or normal, and then some path to some fast Q files. Let's pass that through the channel of from path, uh, which returns us a channel of uh, path elements, like file elements. Um, and we're gonna pass that to split CSV operator. And we're gonna add the argument header equals true uh, to split CSV. I guess if you'll remember, um, we had in our sample sheet CSV, these header columns, ID, repeat, type, fast Q1, fast Q2. This will ensure that when the elements that are returned from split CSV, the elements in the channel, and maps that are keyed by the header names. So this means we don't have to sort of keep track of the header. We don't have to read the header independently. It'll be returned for us and everything will just sort of work out. So let's run this basic Nextflow workflow. And I encourage you to follow along um, if you're watching this. Great. So here we have, uh, it's a little bit hard to read because of the line wrapping, but you can see here that each, each line here is an element in the channel. And each element has is this map. So maps in Groovy are represented in their string form by these square brackets and then these key value pairs separated by commas. So this map has an ID key with a value sample A, a key repeat with value one, key type with value normal, et cetera, et cetera. So now we have this, uh, we're going to pause for a small exercise. So from the dictionary, um, advanced such operators use the split CSV and map operators to return the file data the sample sheet and return a channel that will be suitable for input into this process. Um, so you can feel free to consult the documentation that's linked out here. So this process is going to expect to be provided a channel that has type input where the elements in the channel are a tuple where the first element is an ID and then the second element is a list of fast Q files. So I'm going to pause here and give you time to, to work that out.
Okay, welcome back. I hope you've had a chance to attempt that uh, small uh, exercise. Um, so as I said before, because we specified header true, we have a really convenient way of accessing the, the column headers, which means I'm going to pass it through a map closure um, and I give it a name just to make things a little bit more explicit. So for each row, we're going to return a tuple, like a list um, in square brackets. The first element of the list needs to be a value ID. So I know here that I can see each column, each element in this uh, row has this ID key. So if we just did that, uh, let's have a look at what we returned. Right. We return just the row ID in a list. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to return, make sure this tuple has two elements because the second element needs to be the fast queues. So if I just remind myself of the column headings here, I can see in the sample sheet.csv we have columns fast queue one and fast queue two. So I could do something simple like this. And that's good. Oops. And that's going to get us almost all of the way there. Okay, so this is the, the right sort of shape in that we have a sample ID and then some paths. But it's really important to note here that these at the moment are just strings. Nextflow doesn't necessarily know that this is a path to a file, even though you and I as humans could probably guess this is a path to file. We need to make that explicit to Nextflow. By default, this map, these keys and values are strings um, or integers. Um, but to make turn them into a path, which is going to be important for provisioning the data and sort of Nextflow staging the data, we're going to wrap these in file, the file method like this. So here we have the tuple. The first element is the row ID. The second element is a list. Um, of FastQ files. So let's see what that difference that makes. Great. So now we are actually, next is actually the stringified version of these paths. It's the full path. I want to show you what, just so you can, uh, so you don't have to believe me. Let's double check the class of those elements. So I'm going to use this view operator. And again, I'm going to supply a closure, just like I showed you earlier. The first element is the ID and then fast queues. Um, class of second element is, so fast queues dot first. Let's just have, pull the first fast queue out. I'm going to call the get class method on that element. We'll see, we'll double check that these are actually strings. Great. The class, the second element is class java.lang.string. Whereas if we wrap these in file methods to turn them into real files, so that next one knows to stage them in as symlinks or copy them in if you're operating on the cloud. Great. So now that I've wrapped them in the file method, you can see here that it the class is no longer string, but is now sun.nao.fs.unixpath. The exact class there is not strictly important, <clears throat> but I just wanted to show you another demonstration about how to use that view operator to get a little bit more helpful information. Okay, so in this exercise, as I've noted here in the documentation, we've lost an important piece of metadata, that is, the tumor normal classification. If we look back at the sample sheets here, we were missing this repeat and this type, these repeat and type columns, um, which might be useful later on. Uh, so let's, if we can, it's a really good practice to try and hold on to as much metadata and pass that metadata through the next flow workflow as possible. Don't drop it. There's very little cost to sort of keeping the metadata flowing along through the directed acyclic graph of connected computational processes. It's important to keep that metadata flowing through the graph for as long as possible because you don't know when you might need it. Um, and once it's become sort of 
dissociated from the map data, it's very hard to join it back up again. Well, not hard. Yeah, it's hard to join it back up again. It's much more convenient just to let it flow through. So we've at the moment, we've returned the sample ID and the paths, but we've dropped these two columns, repeat and type. So let's get those back in. So instead of returning just the ID, what I'm going to do is going to make a new map. I'm going to call it MetaMap. Um, and I'm going to give it a rotor ID, maybe a type. And what was the last column? Repeat. And now instead of passing the rotor ID, I'm going to use this MetaMap. So again, this is a map object, what we call maps in uh, Groovy. Uh, if you used a Python, these would be called dictionaries or associative arrays or hashes in Ruby. Um, so this meta map is gonna be the first element. I'm gonna print that through, view that, and just double check and see what it looks like. Fantastic. So now, instead of just having the sample ID, the first element of each, uh, the first item in each element being passed through this channel is a map keyed with keys ID, type, and repeat. So at the moment, it's quite repetitive, this um, the way of define this with ID is row ID, type is row type, repeat is row repeat. This stuttering is a little bit ugly and uh, prone to sort of easy to make mistakes. A little bit later on in the workshop, we're going to show you how to sort of neaten this up. Uh, but I want to sort of put a mental pin in that, uh, keep and remember what this looks like, and we'll find a more advanced or like a, a cleaner way of doing this a little bit later on in the, on in the day. All right, now on to another extraordinarily useful operator, multi-map. The multi-map operator is a way of taking a single input channel and emitting each element into multiple channels, um, multiple output channels. So taking a single channel and for each element, we're gonna pipe that element into multiple output channels. So it's a way of sort of branching um, the operators. So let's assume we've given a sample sheet that has two or more pairs bundled together on the same row. So there'll be sort of far, four FastQ files per row, uh, FastQ1 and FastQ2 for Tumor, and a FastQ1 and FastQ2 for Normal. And let's say we will have a process, our workflow, we'd like to treat the, the Tumor pairs separately from the Normal pairs. They need to go through some extra processing or some sort of QC checks, for example. So using the split, C, split CSV operator would give us one entry um, that contains all four FastQ files. But of course, because of our particular, it's, it's our hypothetical workflow, we need, really need to separate those into individual channels, a channel for just the normal pairs and a channel for just the tumor pairs. And to do that, we can use the multi-map operator. Save my accidental typos. I'm just going to copy and paste it here. So we're taking the split CSV. Um, and we're, instead of reading the sample sheet that I provided earlier, we're reading this sample sheet to ugly.csv. Let's have a look at let's see what that looks like. So as I described earlier, it has four fast queue files per row, two normal fast queues and two, more, two tumor fast queue files, uh, in addition to the normal metadata of ID and repeat. So we're passing it through split CSV with the header true arguments and passing the output of that channel, uh, the output channel from split CSV to the multi-map operator. Again, and we're supplying a closure here to multi-map. We're taking each row and we have this interesting syntax here. So here, the first thing we're doing is defining the name of two output uh, channels. We're gonna, this tumor is gonna be the name of the output channel and this normal is the name of the output channel. So for each row, we're going to do these operations and emit that into the tumor channel. And we're going to do these operations and emit them into the normal channel. So again, we're taking, constructing this metamap object. We're creating a map, again, with a very stuttery, ugly style that we're going to fix later. But we're constructing this metamap. And then in the second elements, we're passing the tumor fastq1 and tumor fastq2 into the tumor output channel. And in the into the normal channel, we're doing basically exactly the same operation, but instead of tumor fastq1, we're passing the normal fastq1 and normal fastq2. 
So for each row in the input CSV, we're passing, um, we're making an output channel tumor that has the map and two tumor fastq files and the normal output channel, which has the map, the metadata map, and then the normal fastq files. And then we're using this set operator to define the outputs for giving it a name. We could also do it like this. So samples equals the output for this. But I think a lot of people in the community prefer this sort of more linear style. That is the data flows from top to bottom and then we give it a name here. So now we have this new object called samples. And this samples has two output channels which we can address by name with a dot notation. So this tumor refers to this name here. So the samples.tumor is an output channel, which we're viewing here, tumor.it. Let's just view one at a time and we'll see what it looks like. Oops. So we're expecting here to find metamap and then fastq pairs, fastq1 and fastq2, just for the tumor samples. Again, fastq1, fastq2, the adjusted tumor samples and the first element in each, uh, the first item in each element in the channel is this meta map. Perfect. If we uncomment this, we should be able to see null uh, as well. So it's going to get a little bit busy, the terminal. Perfect. And I'm again, I'm using the closure to the view operator to make sure I uh, disambiguate between tumor and normal in the outputs. So there's some details here. Um, we could, unfortunately, because of the way the multi-map um, needs to return multiple channels. So using name closures, as, as we talked about earlier, is not gonna work. Um, if that said, if you really want to do it, Nextload provides this convenience method, um, multi-map criteria to allow you to find named multi-map closures, you should need them. But, and I've linked out the documentation here if you'd like to do it. Um, but in the interest of time, we're gonna skip over that because I think, in almost all cases, this sort of notation uh, where you define the closures in line inside of the multi-map um, operator call is, is, is fine. That will get you 99% of the way there. The next operator on our tour is the branch operator. Um, linked out to the documentation here. But the branch operator way, it, it, the branch operator is a way of taking a single input channel and turning that into a new element, into one and only one of a selection of output channels, or one, actually it can't can be more than one um, output channel. So in the example that we talked about here, the multi-map operator was necessary because we, for each row, we wanted to emit into two channels for each row. Um, but let's say we had a NIDA sample sheet, for example, the one, sample sheet.csv, the one where we had for each row, we ha had a normal pair and a tumor pair, or rather the normal pair and tumor pair were in separate rows. But let's say we'd still like to have output channels, rather we'd like to generate a channel that has just the tumor pairs and a, an output channel that has just the normal pairs. So we don't need to split up each row into um, two different channels like we did for the multi-map. In this case, the sample sheet.csv versus the sample sheet.ugly.csv. In this case, we just need to decide which output channel each row needs to go to. And for that, we're gonna use the branch operator. So here we're taking a channel from path and we're making, uh, passing this path here, passing it through split CSV, just as we've done before. So nothing has changed there. We're using this map operation, which takes a row and generates this meta map and then a, a list of fastq files. So that will look just to be clear. Let's have a look at what that what is returned here. Fantastic. So this is just the meta map and then a list of a list of paths. So we're going to take that and we're going to pass it through this branch operator and then give it a name called samples. 
So the branch operator takes this meta and reads. And again, just as with multi-map, we're defining the names of the output closures with this name and then a colon. Um, and then the, to the right-hand side of this uh, name, we're going to define an expression that returns a Boolean value, which says for each element being passed into the branch operator, so for each row in the split CSV, it's going to try and match one of these Boolean operations. So does it match this condition? If so, the element is emitted into the tumor channel. If not, it passes down to the next test. Does the row match this condition? If so, it passes to normal. If no conditions are met, uh, then the uh, element is discarded and is not output into either of these tumor or normal channel in, into either of these tumor or normal channels. We happen to know ahead of time in this particular example, every row is either meta dot type is tumor or meta dot type is normal. But you can example, you can think, you can imagine situations where you might want to filter in addition to this branch operation. Uh, so let's have a look at what is output here, just to make sure. So I'm taking again. I'm giving it a name samples and this samples object is a sort of a complicated object in that it's an, a list of two or it's like an object that contains two channels, a tumor channel and a normal channel. We can address them again, just as before with multi-map, this dot notation. So sample.tumor returns us the channel where elements meet this condition and the sample.normal channel returns all elements where this condition is met. So if I view those, Fantastic. So we have yeah, normal, and then we note that for this fast queue, it's a normal fast queue. And again, for this one, it's a normal fast queue. And we have the matching tumor pairs here. So emitted into the tumor channel, or the samples dot, uh, samples dot tumor channel, we have uh, this tumor r1 dot fast queue gz, and we have uh, tumor r2 dot fast queue dot gz. Uh, and the element is only emitted to the first channel where the condition is met. If it doesn't meet any conditions, as I said before, it's just discarded. Um, we could simplify this. You could, um, you might, if you would like to avoid discarding any elements, you might consider introducing a sort of catch-all channel other with just a condition true. So if an element passes through each of these and this returns false and this condition returns false, then it'll sort of fall through. This always returns true. So any rows that are supplied as input into this branch operator, if they don't match these, will end up being supplied into other. In this particular condition, in this particular situation, I happen to know ahead of time that every row has either type as normal or type as tumor. So in this case, there are no that samples to other is an empty channel. But you might want to consider doing this sort of uh, taking this sort of practice to sort of make your pipelines and workflows a little bit more resilient. You might want to um, warn the user, and we can use the next load built-in method log dot warn um to to warn the user uh, or even more strictly log to error so return an error and sort of halt the workflow if one of these uh condition if something appears in this samples to other channel so if there are no samples that don't happen to meet either of those then the workflow will proceed as normal no errors generated here um but if you did have a sample a row that didn't meet that actually let's see what that looks like Oops. Let's duplicate this and instead of a uh, tumor or normal in the type column, we're going to say unexpected. Let's put it towards the top. So now uh, we will have that row that passes through this test. This will return false. This will return false and it will fall through to other and where it will be passed through here and the log.error will be called. Mm -hmm. 
and here it is. I was not expecting this. And then obviously this is not a particularly helpful error message. I'll leave it up to you as an exercise for the reader to put a more helpful error, error message, but I want to show you here the error has still occurred. More simply, if you are confident ahead of time that you have um, only sort of two conditions, a meta dot type is tumor or something else, um, then you could simplify the expression like this. I'm going to get rid of our unexpected row. Next low run. And we returned a tumor and normal output channels. So in this example so far, all that we've done is the emitted the inputs verbatim without any sort of modification. We've just taken the inputs and channeled them into one of these two output channels, either samples.tumor or samples.normal. And we've not made any changes to those elements as they've passed through. But we can, the branch operator does give us the option to um, make some changes and emit a slightly different object into that output channel. And we can do this with this return syntax. Um, Let's return, instead of returning the meta object without sort of just transparently, we're going to use the plus notation to add a new key uh, to sort of combine two maps. So here now we are, uh, I'm just going to comment out that normal. But here, instead of just passing meta and reads transparently through, we're returning a new element, which is the result of a meta added to this new map. So this is combining new maps, basically giving this new key to the map and passing the reads through transparently. So if we run this and view the outputs of the tumor channel, we should see that the meta map now has a new key uh, with the value, my value. Uh, so this is a way of appending um, new keys to the map or changing the map as it passes through the branch operator. So I have another exercise here. I'm going to pause for a couple of minutes. Um, so how would you modify the element returned in the tumor channel, so the samples.tumor, to have the key value pair type abnormal instead of type tumor? So we'll give you five minutes to, to work on that, and I'll be back uh, in a second.
Yeah, welcome back. Um, so the exercise was, how would you modify the element return in this tumor channel to have this a new key value pair? So the type is abnormal instead of type tumor. So there's a couple of different ways of, in do, of doing that. Um, I've laid out one potential solution here. Uh, we can use this uh, plus notation to not only add keys to a map, but also to overwrite keys. Um, so the plus operator combines two maps um, and precedence is given to the map on the right. So if these two maps, this map and the meta map um, have shared keys, the key on the right will take precedence and overwrite the one on the left. The plus method also returns a new object, returns a new map. So we're not actually modifying the original map, which is an important, uh, important sort of qualification, which we might talk about in a little bit more detail in the, later in the workshop. But this meta map, meta plus this new map returns us a new, uh, a new map where the type is no longer type tumor, but the type should be type abnormal. So let's run the workflow. Just double check that our keys are working correctly. This override is working correctly. Perfect, great. You can see here that in the tumor channel, we have the keys ID, repeat, and type, and the values in type are all abnormal. Whereas earlier, before we overwrote them here, they were type tumor. So I want to talk a little bit um, here about this samples object. <clears throat> this samples object, uh, let's have a look. We can see what sort of class it is. going to return us a uh, sort of a class internal to next flow. The details of this you won't use on an everyday basis, but it's interesting to show you how, how you might go about finding this. We have this class nextflow.script.channel out. And this channel out object, um, this samples object, is actually an object that contains multiple output channels. You can see, this, see us addressing each of those here with a dot notation. Um, and there are a couple of different uh, operators which return these multiple output channels. <clears throat> the multi-map and branch operators are two obvious examples. Um, uh, so as you can see here, let's just simplify our example a little bit. So here we have a workflow, which takes uh, five integers, passes from this multi-map channel and returns um, two output channels, small and large, where the large is the input with 10. So add it to 10. So we have a small, numbers.small and numbers.large, two independent channels. And again, in large, we have 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And in small, we have one, two, three, four, and five. Uh, so we can, we here we're using the equal sign to assign the numbers uh, variable to hold those two output channels. So we can also use the set notation to achieve the same result. But a more interesting situation, as I've noted here, occurs when you have a process that accepts multiple channels as input. For example, Let's say I'm going to add this debug true directive. This will just ensure that everything printed from the script to standard output is echoed out to standard output on the next flow command line. So this process multi input is going to take two channels. I'm going to take a small number and a channel containing a big number. This script just runs an echo and says small is, and next level will do the work of replacing this dollar sign um, with the value supplied from the first channel. 
and big num will be the value supplied from the second channel. And it'll run this process for each. So we um, we have this process multi-input. So it takes two channels. Um, we can call it like this. Stop small and numbers dot large I'm going to comment out those new calls so multi input we supply it with two channels numbers dot small and numbers dot large and if we run this workflow oops I've made a small typo instead of big num I've called it bug num Perfect. So because I've had this debug true directive, which again, it's a really helpful way, uh, helpful little thing for debugging, whatever's echoed to standard output inside of the script, usually will just be silently um, captured by next low in the dot command dot out and the dot command dot log error. For example, if we took See the command log for any one of those tasks. We can see the standard output um, from that task. But if we use debug true, the debug true directive, then the outputs for each of those processes are echoed out to standard output. So it's a quick quick way of double checking and seeing what is happening inside of these scripts. So the this multi boot channel. This multiple process takes two channels, a small and large, which, which we've addressed by name here. So we've taken this multi-map operator. The output of that is assigned to the numbers variable, and then we've pulled out each channel from that number stop variable. But we could even more concisely pass that in directly. Because the output from multi-map is an object that contains two channels, we can pipe that into a process that expects two channels. Um, and this will work in exactly the same way. This can be a handy shortcut for making your workflows even more concise. But again, as with some, a lot of these tips, most of the time you're going to want to do the standard, um, the standard approach with assigning a variable and then addressing them uh, directly. More of, this is the case more often not because generally those output channels want to go to distinct paths, paths through the DAG. But I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone's aware that you can, if you happen to be a, have a process that accepts multiple channels, you can pipe them indirectly. So the, the final clean solution looks like that, which is very, very tidy. Okay. Uh, now on to a, a real favorite operator, group tuple. So this is very, again, very commonly used, more commonly used than multi-map and branch operators. The group operator is a way of taking a single input channel and combining elements from that channel that share some common key. So let's take this workflow as an example. We're taking a channel from path, again, sample sheet CSV, CSV, passing it through split CSV. So again, exactly the same start to all of the examples we've seen so far. We're passing it through map, where we're turning this row into a tuple, um, like a list where the first element is a meta map, and then we have the row to repeat, and then we have uh, the row to fast queue. One of the changes we're making here in this example is the meta map only contains two keys, ID and type. So we're no longer including the row dot repeat in this meta map. And that's because we're going to use this, we're going to pass this to group tuple, but we only want to group on the row and the type. So we want basically to ensure that the repeats for each sample end up in the same element in the output channel. And because group tuple by default will group on the first element, in which in this case is the meta object. If we were to include the row to repeat inside this meta object, then we wouldn't have, um, then each element would be distinct. Uh, the first element for each uh, would be distinct, which would defeat the purpose of the group tuple. 
So let's, before we pass it through group tuple, let's have a look at what this returns. So here we have um, the first element. Here we have sample ID type normal. And if we search through these, you can see here that there are two elements in this channel which share this common key, a meta map with ID sample A and type normal. There's two elements. Similarly, there are two two elements in the channel that share this key, sample A type tumor. If we were to pass this through the group tuple operator, now elements that have shared a key will be joined together. So here we have the key, and then the row repeat has been turned into a list of row repeats. Similarly, the list of fastq file paths has been turned into a list of list of fastq paths. So the first element in this list is a list of uh, two fastq paths, and the second element is another list of fastq paths. For elements where there was no other elements that shared the same keys, for example here, we just end up with one element in the list of repeats and one element in the list of fastq paths. So this is a very handy way of sort of grouping uh, data together. A really important caveat that we're going to address later is that this is a blocking operation. So we don't know, Nextflow doesn't know until all the elements have passed through here, which ones it can group. So this is, if you have this group tuple in a workflow, we're going to show a way to uh, mediate this a little bit later on in the workshop um, in the next section. Uh, but by default, group tuple is blocking in that all elements have to pass through here. And then only once all elements um, are, are passed into group tuple will it start emitting output elements into the output channel. So this can be blocking. Um, by default, almost all, all of the next law operations are deeply asynchronous in that um, elements will be fired into the output channel as fast as possible to get your data through the graph as fast as possible and get you to your outputs and results as fast as possible. But this group tuple is cannot finish, cannot start emitting items until all the inputs are ready. We're gonna talk a little bit more, more about that in a second. And the last element I wanna cover here on our operator tour is the transpose operator. So the transpose operator is a way of sort of rotating um, matrices or like lists of lists, um, which can be a little bit difficult to visualize, Rather than going through sort of um, that sort of rotation operator, a handy way to think about it is as the inverse, and this is the way it's most often used, or it is often used as the inverse of the trans the group tuple operator. Um, I'd encourage you to, in your own time, have a play around with the transpose operator because uh, it can be very handy. But I want to show you what it looks like when uh, in its operation as the inverse of group tuple. So we have this group tuple um, elements, the ones I've just shown you earlier. So we have um, the meta map and then a list of repeats and then a list of fast Q pairs. If I pass this through transpose, what we're returned is back our the same elements that we viewed before we passed it through group tuple. So that is elements with a meta map, a single repeat, and then a pair of fastq files. So the transpose operator can be thought of as the inverse of a group tuple, can be helpful for sort of undoing that operation in, in particular contexts. And that concludes our chapter on uh, the operator tours. From here, we're going to take a uh, short break. Um, if you're watching this live, now's a great chance, if you haven't already, to drop by the CEP23 CEP advanced training channel on the NF Core Slack. Uh, myself and uh, other volunteers are hanging out there. If you have any questions, we'd love to help um, help out. Um, if you want to chat anything Nextflow or NF Core, um, we'd love to talk to you there. Um, of course, very welcome to uh, pop in questions all the way through the workshop. Um, 
that we'll see you there. Um, if not, we'll see you back here for more training in half an hour. See you soon.
this chapter is all about metadata propagation. Uh, it's a really important concept in sort of batch processing, computational biology, and bioinformatics to attach metadata to the samples and the, to the inputs and outputs of processes as data flows through your graph of what your through your workflow. Um, Nextflow has a bunch of really helpful concepts that make this easy for you. Um, and so here we're covering uh, some do's and don'ts about metadata propagation and in batch workflows. Let's talk about metadata. This is a hugely important concept in Nextflow um, and in batch processing in general. Nextflow has some strong opinions about how metadata should be handled. Metadata should be explicit. Um, be very wary of metadata encoded in file names. There'll be times where you want to include metadata that's higher dimensional or more interestingly shaped that doesn't fit into a file name or contains characters or you want to support characters that would, would make illegal file names. And the other important concept is that metadata should travel through the channels in Nextflow with the data. Ideally, as something like a tuple element, like a map, something simple um, but flexible. All right, let's give some examples. First of all, um, as with all the chapters, I'm going to CD into advanced and in this case, metadata. So this chapter contains a little main.nf um, to help get us started. As I've explained here, I, in an ideal situation, um, Nextflow workflows begin with a sample sheet, uh, some semi-structured data, CSV, TSV, something similar like that. Um, but for the sort of exercise, uh, well, let's begin with the worst case scenario. If someone's just given you a bag of data, maybe it's a directory with some FastQ files in it. We're just gonna use FastQ as an example. And you need to make sense of these things. Um, we're gonna use this really sort of worst case scenario to introduce some helpful Ruby syntax um, and some features that will be helpful in more complicated uh, workflows in another next load context. So uh, let's have a look at this data directory. So here inside of data, we have a directory called reads and inside that we have a directory called treatments or treatment A with a bag of fastq files and then a directory called treatment B with a bag of fastq files, side few. We kind of have a couple of sample sheets in here, which we're going to ignore for the moment. So whoever handed us this data has violated one of our two important principles in, in that it looks like they're encoding some metadata in file names. There's some underscore separated list of metadata inside of the file name. Um, and what we want to do is pull that out of a file name, get it as quickly as we can into a metadata object, like a real map um that we can pass through the files uh, pass through the workflow um, in Nextflow. so the first pass the sort of data flow that you've inherited here that i've given you as an example is very simple little workflow it's two lines it uses the from file pairs method uh it's a channel creation method um, and it generates us a channel um with files that match this pattern let's have a look what happens when we run this And it gives us a channel, lots of elements in lots of elements in the channel. Uh, each element is a tuple. First is a key, and then a list of matching pairs, like a pair of FastQ files. This from file pairs method is doing some work for us. It's already pulling out uh, this key, so it's the sort of first part of this match up to the R1, R2, uh, and then it's given us the two the two files here. Um, in this case, the ID is just a simple string, um, and we want to sort of augment that and make it a map uh, to store some more complicated data, uh, because we might have more than one piece of metadata to track. Like, for example, we might want to also encode the true and normal status, or the replicate status, or the sample ID uh, explicitly, rather than having them in this underscore separated uh, string. There are lots of different ways in which we might do this, but the first thing, let's use this tokenized method, which I introduced here, um, to break up that key, this sample key, into its constituent parts. We're going to pass this through the map operator. We're going to give the um, inputs to this closure names. We're gonna, we know that it's an ID and then a list of reads. I'm going to use the tokenized method, which is like the split method in Python or Ruby, 
um, to split that string on underscores. It's going to return us a list of uh, strings. I'm just going to run it. And because uh, the closure returns the last uh, the, la the value from the last expression and the assignment of this tokens uh, variable in returns the tokens variable itself. Um, and I'm piping that to view. So I can see here that tokens is equal to this list. We have a sample, a rep, and a tumor normal status. So if we're pretty confident, like this is a very basic sort of schema, we're just going to assume everything is underscore separated. But if we're confident about the stability here, we can destructure that list into um, its component pieces and give them names directly. So we can say sample replicate type equals a to tokenize. Let's have a look and see what that returns us. The same, uh, perfect. But now, because we've destructured this, we can use sample as a variable name, replicate as a variable name, and type as a variable name. It's a little bit stuttery and repetitive here. Um, what we're doing here is we're making a new variable meta. We're making a map with the keys sample, replicate, and type, and the values sample we're pulling here from these destructured contexts, replicate, and type. Great. So now we have the metadata as a map rather than an underscore separated string uh, and then a list of reads. I want to note here that I'm using this destructuring only works in a tuple, which is the parentheses separated list, uh, and not square brackets, which is gives you a, a list. Um, if we wanted to get a little bit fancier, uh, we could also use the transpose and collect entries to produce the same map. Uh, let's give an example about how to do that. So this is a perfectly valid solution to this problem um, and a perfectly reasonable way of doing it. But just as an excuse to introduce some more uh, groovy syntax, let's say, given this is an advanced workshop, we're going to take this id.tokenize and so here, Let's have a look at what this returns us. So what we're doing is we're tokenizing that ID into its constituent parts. And we are we have that list. It'll be a list of its pieces. And then we have a list of keys we want to assign. Um, that will look like this. So each element in the channel is a list of the constituent parts from the sample and then a list of keys that we want. What we can do then is call on that the transpose method, which just like the transpose method from the operator tour, rotates the list. So now instead of um, being a list of two pieces where each piece is a list of three elements, we have three lists of two run two list of three. We have the sample, the actual sample name, and then the key value, the uh, key, the value key, value key. And then we can pass that, call the collect entries method on that list. And we're just going to switch these around. Perfect. So now we have a map, keyed by sample, replicate, and type. And from there, just to make it a little bit more readable, I'm going to put these on new lines. So that's a little uh, slightly cleaner way of, of, of getting, that, um, getting that map. But it gets us to the same place where we have a map with keys, sample, replicate, and type, and then a list of fast key paths. 
Note here that the fastq paths are the full paths, which means that next flow inside the from file pairs method has already done the work of wrapping those into turning those strings of paths into file objects or path objects. Um, so if we go back to the previous method, that is this one here. And let's say we make a change. We would like to make a change. Um, we've defined, decided the rep prefix should be removed. Um, we can use regular expressions. So you'll notice here that any of the replicates, they're, they're named rep1, rep2, rep3, or rather rep1 and rep2. Let's say instead of rep1 and rep2, we would just like them to read one or two for the replicates. So turn those into integers or simple integers. Another really handy syntax sugar that is available inside of Groovy is uh, subtracting regular expressions from strings. So I'm going to use, so I could say replicate equals replicate take a regular expression. So it starts with rep. And now instead of rep one, rep two, replicate is just replicate one, replicate one, replicate one replica two, replica two. So we've removed that rep prefix from those key values, uh, from those values. Another little syntactic sugar, instead of replicate equals replicate take, we can just write replicate take equals. So these two lines are equivalent. If we're gonna take something from itself, um, we can just assign that as replicate take equals a regular expression. Just to show you that I'm not lying. Let's run it again. Perfect. As I've noted here, there are some really helpful little syntactic sugars, um, pieces that Groovy provides to you um, and that are available inside of Nextflow. So you can trim uh, parts of a string from another thing. So if I have the string one, two, three, I can subtract from that two uh, and that'll give me the string one, three. Or I can subtract, so I can subtract in this case a string, just a plain old string. Or instead of subtracting a string, I can subtract a regular expression. So here I'm subtracting the regular expression T and then any character and then O, then optionally a space. So uh, you can subtract strings and re regular expressions from strings to sort of make your life a little bit easier. So here we're almost what we, where we want, um, but we, still don't have the treatment um, captured in our metadata. Just as a reminder, if we look in the data directory, we have these fast queues that live inside a directory called treatment A or treatment B. And so at the moment we have the sample ID, the replicate and the tumor normal status encoded in our metadata, simple sample replicate type. But we also want to capture this treatment data. So it's available to us sort of in that you can see here in the paths, we have, we have this treatment B, but we wanna pull it out and get it into our metadata. To do that, um, these reads objects are objects that implement this java.nio.path interface. Um, I'm linked out here if you wanna check the full documentation, but that interface gives us some really useful uh, methods, uh, including get parent. So if I just comment this out. So what I'm taking here is this reads, which is a list of paths. I'm calling the collect method on it. And that's sort of like the map method inside of Nextflow. So we're calling this closure on each element in the reads list. So that's two in this case, it's uh, two elements, two paths, and we're calling the get parent method on each of those. So let's just see what that returns us. Let's save that, run the workflow. Okay, so that returns us the parent, which is just the treatment A or treatment B directories. It gives us the full path, so it's the, it's the path of the parent directory. Um, and another really handy little groovy syntactic sugar piece is this star dot uh, method, which we call the spread dot notation. 
So another way of writing reads.collect it.parent is if we're just calling a simple method on a single method on each of these elements, so it dot some method, we can abbreviate that with this. So these two lines, lines eight and line nine are equivalent. Just to show you, oops, I've left um, an extra, extra dot in there. Great. So then just as before, we return the parent methods. So this returns another path object, um, but instead of this whole path, we really want to turn it into a string which just contains the name, that final directory name. Um, so we have a list. We can use that same spread dot notation to call the get name on each of those elements. So now the get name takes a path and returns just the terminal fragment. So now we're just left with treatment A or treatment B. Um, the last thing I liked, so another way of doing that, if we wanted to do it the long way would be, so these two lines are now equivalent. But this is a little bit shorter, a bit nicer. And the last thing we want to note is that there is an extra piece of syntactic sugar in how Groovy deals with these get and set methods. So there's a lot of methods that start with this get prefix, get parent, get name, get simple name. For any methods that are of this type, get something, um, where that something begins with a capital letter, you can get that method, <laughs> have access to the uh, that method, using this sort of property style notation where you just call reads dot parent and name. So these three L three methods. So that is the same as so this it dot get parent is the same as it dot parent and it dot get name is the same as it.name. So we can, all four of these lines are equivalent, but we have this really lovely short method using the spread notation and the property style syntax. Just to show you that it's still working. Let's run it. Great. Treatment A, treatment A, treatment B, treatment B. So that's what we're going to go for. Um, Actually, got one more uh, thing to do. Just as before, we had where we had rep one, rep two, which we wanted to shorten and remove the rep prefix to just one and two. We might want to do the same thing here, but we have treatment A, treatment B, but we might just want A and B. So we want to remove the prefix. Um, just as we used the subtract method before, that subtract method is just um, an alias for the dot minus method. So we could call dot collect um, it dot minus um, so we might do that, or we can use the even shorter version and use our spread dot notation again dot minus. And we're going to subtract from each element in this list, this regular expression. Right, so now we're just left with the A's and the B's from the treatment. So of course, in this particular example, um, treatment A and treatment B are always going to be the same uh, for each of the pairs, but we're just going to continue along with this for the sake of demonstration. So our final map pleasure, these are all equivalent, so we're going to delete them. So uh, that treatment, 
reverse and uh, treatment forward and treatment reverse is what's returned from this uh, spread dot notation collection. Um, and then we're going to tokenize that. We're going to remove the replicate prefix. Um, let's give ourselves a little bit of space here. Lastly, we're going to add treatment forward and treatment reverse. Great. So that meta object now contains these keys in blue. And we return to here, the meta and the reads. We're piping that to view, so we should be able to see it from the standard output. So now we have all of the metadata in a convenient little, uh, a convenient meta map with the key sample, replicate type, treatment forward and treatment reverse. So this metadata now can flow through the graph with the reads um, that we can use to split, join, recombine, group, tuple uh, the data. The resulting channel um, would be perfect to pass to a process that looks like something like examples that has input. Um, this channel that has a val meta object as the first element and some reads as the second element. And this pattern is very common in a lot of Nextflow workflows, particularly in the NF core workflows. So if you have your data in this sort of style, you can import modules from NF core and start using those almost immediately. So we're going to see a lot more of this sort of shape of um, a channel where we have a meta object and then some uh, paths or reads. Perfect. And that wraps up the metadata propagation chapter. Welcome to a new chapter. This chapter is all about grouping and splitting. So this is one of my favorite concepts in Nextflow. Um, and I think it speaks to one of the strengths of Nextflow, how to group and split and sort of construct more complicated graph structures inside of your workflow, how to um, take data from multiple processes, split them apart, and then join them, them back together uh, further down the DAG. Uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, let's get started. Great. As before, and as with all the other chapters, we're going to CD into advanced, uh, into the chapter directory. In this case, it's advanced slash grouping. And we have a little main.nf, uh, which in this case is actually just blank. Um, let's see what is in this data directory. So we have as before, a data directory. And this time we have a genome.faster, maybe a faster index, some interval bed files, and our reads from the last chapter split into treatment A and treatment B. We also have a sample sheet uh, in ugly and a clean form. So let's start with our main.nf. Um, let's start with a real basic workflow. We are reading channel from path, a sample sheet.csv. Let's just remind ourselves what this sample sheet looks like. Oops. This is a really simple little sample sheet. ID, repeat, type, FASQ1, FASQ2. Really simple. Um, we're passing it through split CSV, which we talked about earlier today. Um, we're passing this through a map operation where we're taking each row, we're constructing a meta map object, and we're passing this into a tuple um, that returns. Uh, so we're turning a, a list where the first element is the metadata map, and the second element in the list is a list of file objects. We're doing one more modification that we haven't seen yet today, and that is we're adding this check if exists true method. So this is a handy little method. To, argument to the file method, which will have Nextflow go out and check uh, to make sure that file actually exists. This check if exists true works both on local files, on a local file system, but also on remote files in blob storage, for example. Uh, so let's just run that. See what we get, just to make sure that everything's working as we expect. Fantastic. So we, we're passing it to view, so we echoing everything on standard out, but we see our meta maps and we see our lists of fast cube files. Um, 
So one of the things that I flagged earlier today um, was that I was not really happy with the stuttering, repetitive nature of the way we were defining our meta maps here. This ID, row, ID, repeat, row, repeat, type, row, type. Um, we want to sort of, I mean, it's ugly to look at, but it's also error prone. Um, we can, if we want, make use of the submap method. It's already a method defined on maps, defined in Groovy, to quickly return a new map constructed of a subset of an existing map. So here, from split CSV, we already returned a map because we specified header true. If we didn't specify header true, we just end up with a list. But because we've, we know we have headers in our CSV and we've supplied this argument, we returned a map in this row object. Because we were taking a map here and we want a map further down, rather than making a new map like this, where we define each of the fields in turn, what we can do is meta equals row dot submap, and then just supplies arguments, the keys that we want to pull out from that map. So these two rows, are identical, they will return the same result. Um, so instead of row, row ID, repeat, row, repeat, type, row, type, we're just using the submap and specifying the keys that we want. I'll let you follow along, I'll give you a moment to catch up. I'm gonna comment that out and run next flow just a sanity check that everything's working as we expect. Great. So we have our, we've turned our row map into our meta map by using the sub map. So we've just pulled out these three keys. Um, and something that's really important that I want to note here, and I have a bite-sized talk about this, um, is that goes into this concept in a little more detail, but we want to ensure that we're treating this meta map safely. This sub map method returns a new map uh, rather than making a modification to the existing existing map row. So it's really important, I think, when you're using map operations or any of these closures inside of Nextflow to ensure that you're always returning a new object rather than modifying the object in place. This is because Nextflow is deeply asynchronous. And uh, if you are modifying a map in place or modifying any object in place, it could be that somewhere else in the workflow, um, that same object in memory is being used in a different part of the workflow. So if you're modifying it in place somewhere, that will affect uh, uh, an operation elsewhere in the workflow, which is undesirable and can be difficult to can cause errors that are difficult to debug. So this row submap the plus um, argument that we talked about earlier for combining maps. Both submap and plus return new maps instead of modifying the original map in place. So those are safe operations and perfectly good to use. So now we're going to pause for five minutes for this exercise. Can we extend this workflow in an unsafe manner? Um, so instead of using submap, what happens if we return this, uh, modify this row option, operator in a uh, row object in place? Um, can you? do something unsafe, just as an exercise. Um, obviously not uh, something that would be encouraged in real workflows, but it's an interesting exercise to see if you can break it. I'm gonna give you five minutes for uh, to pause here.
Okay, welcome back. I hope you had a chance to attempt that exercise. Um, don't worry if it was a little bit challenging. I'm not sure if I've really given you all of the tools you need to uh, do this completely, but I wanted to give you the opportunity to have a go um, just in case. So let's take this. I've got one potential solution here um, of how to unsafely modify the objects. So we're going to take this samples channel. We're going to map it through a closure which does nothing. It just map, sleeps for um, a small amount of time and then returns the object unmodified. And just reviews the, uh, the meta object. Um, because this closure does nothing, remember the closure returns the last expression, which in this case is it. So just whatever was passed in just passes through transparently without making any changes. So we should see here in the view channel that after should be unmodified, the same meta that we passed in earlier. In parallel, we're gonna do another map operation on the samples channel. We're gonna take that same samples channel and we're gonna pass it through this operation. Um, we're going to say that assign the type to be broken. And so And we're just going to view those results. So here we should be seeing we're viewing two channels. First, we're expecting to view unmodified meta maps because we're passing samples. We're not doing anything to it. Um, we're just sleeping and passing through unmodified. We should see that unmodified meta objects here. But in the second example, we're viewing another channel. We're taking the same samples channel. We're passing it through a map operation to produce a new channel where we're modifying the type value to see be broken. Let's see what happens when we run this. Note here, the type is broken in both the modified and the unmodified channels. This is happening because while this is sleeping, we've modified in this map operation here, the type value, um, type the value under the type key. And because this meta is the same object in memory, um, and we're doing this dangerous operation of modifying in place, uh, this breaks the unmodified expectation here. So to do this safely, what we would do is use the plus operation, which I've already described returns a new object and is a safe operation. So if we use this plus object instead of modifying in place with type meta.type equals, fantastic. So now the unmodified versions have type normal, type tumor, type normal, and the, where we expect it to be modified returns type broken, which is, is what we'd expect. So, the summary is these plus operations are perfectly safe and, and good to use, but the modifying in place like this meta.type is broken, that will uh, is a dangerous operation and should be avoided wherever possible. So let's um, talk about passing maps through processes. Let's construct a dummy read process. Um, this is not very advanced bioinformatics, but it's just going to stand in place for a real operation. So let's just imagine this is a BWA operation or something similar. We have a process here called map reads, which takes as input two channels. The first channel is a channel of the form meta and then reads, so a value and then a path. And then the second channel we expect to be given a, a path to a genome file. And we output some startup BAM. And the script here is just a dummy operation, which would just going to stand in place for a real uh, a BWA or ISAT2 mapping operation. And the workflow we're going to 
change slightly as well. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new channel called reference. And that reference channel is going to be a channel from path and the data genome.faster. And we're calling the dot first method. This is really important because by calling dot first, we're returning a value channel rather than a, uh, a regular channel. This means that it's inexhaustible and we can reuse, re-pull that values from the reference uh, channel um, over and over again. It's not going to be consumed in the same way. Uh, the rest of it, we're going to construct this uh, samples channel and perfect. So here, we're just going to call the map reads process. We're going to pass it two channels. The first channel is going to be the samples channel that we construct here. And the second channel is going to be the reference, uh, which is a value channel pulling that genome.faster file. Let's see these uh, operations happen. So here we have our meta object, uh, sample repeat type, and then a path to a BAM file, um, which of course is just an empty uh, BAM file, but standing in place for a real BAM file. So now we have a BAM file, but we might want to merge these repeats. So we have uh, mapped these reads individually for different repeats, but for example, sample A type normal is represented in two BAM files here. Let's say we'd like to conduct a sort of a BAM merging operation. Uh, and so we need to join these, these two channels together uh, into one. For that, we're going to use the group tuple. If you remember from our operator tour, the group tuple groups channels, uh, groups of elements from a channel by some sort of key. And by default, it's the first element in the, uh, in the item emitted by the channel. So from map reads, we're going to have to make a modification because at the moment, the first element in the channel, the thing that we'll be grouping by is this meta map operation, which includes the repeat, which means that this is distinct from this, um, where we need them to be the same so they can be joined together. So to do that, I'm gonna conduct a map operation, meta, bam, and we're gonna use our friendly sub map and we're just going to pull out the ID and the type. Um, so we're going to pull out the ID and the type from this. We're going to lose the repeat. And we're just going to return the BAM. Let's see what that looks like. I'm going to use the resume operation so I don't have to recalculate those BAMs, even though they were just very short. Right, so now we have these uh, elements where we have, for example, here, two elements that share exactly the same key, and that can be used to group tuple and combine them. So we're going to pull out and find all elements that share this same key, which is a submap containing keys ID and type. Excellent. So now we have some elements in the channel with one element because there was only one to begin with. Uh, there was no grouping necessary, but others, here we have an element in the channel that has a meta map ID sample A type tumor that has two elements, two BAM files that can be used to join together. By default, the group tuple, as I said, groups on the elements, the groups on the first item in the element, uh, which at the moment is the meta map. We can turn that um, map into a special class using the group key method, uh, which takes our grouping object as the first parameter and the number of expected elements as a second parameter. You might remember earlier today, I talked about group tuple being a blocking operation. That is, it won't emit anything until all of the inputs have been ingested. So it knows how many, um, so I know that it's, it's, it, that it's safe to start emitting elements, that it has the complete picture. Um, that it's not going to accidentally miss an element in the group tuple. This group key uh, method, we're going to change this meta object into a group key object. 
um, that encodes how many um, how many elements we expect. Um, in in the group. So here we're going to change this after map reads. We're going to change this map operation. Let's say the key equals. We're going to use the group key function. Uh, pass it the meta map, same as before. Meta dot sub map, and then we need the number of items in the group. But the question is. How do we get this number? The second argument to group key is the number of the items in the group. The question is, how do we get that uh, value? I've left that as an exercise here. So how might we modify something upstream of this so that we have the number of the items in the group available uh, to use here? Eventually we're gonna use it like this, key and then bam. But how are we going to get this? I'll leave that as an exercise for you. Uh, we'll give it five or uh, four, five or so minutes.
Okay, welcome back. Um, I hope you had a go. Um, I hope you had luck um, trying to work out this little problem. The key here is that we are we need to know at what point uh, somewhere upstream, ideally somewhere before the expensive, let's assume this map rates operation takes a long time. Before the expensive map rates, we need to encode the number of items in the group. Uh, we can do that earlier. I'm just gonna give ourselves a little bit more space here. Here is an example solution. So we take the CSV as before, we split it on rows. Uh, we return the submap just as before. But here, I'm gonna group early before the submap, before the mapping operations. I'm gonna do the same thing where we group on ID and type uh, and then group tuple so that we have the number so we have our repeats already grouped. So just so you can see what that looks like. Here, we take the map, we group on ID and type, we include the metadata repeat because we're gonna need to pull that out again later. Um, because let's say we need it for the mapping operation and the reads. We group tuple, so we group on this small submap. So now we have the map that we're going to use later after the mapping operation. These are the repeat numbers, and then these are the fast QGZ lists. Now from here, I know how many repeats there are because it's the number of elements in this, this value here, the second element in the, uh, the second item in the uh, element of the tuple. So for these two samples, I know that there are two repeats. And for this sample, I know there's only one repeat. So to encode that, uh, I can use this repeats.size. The size method uh, on a collection returns the number of elements in that collection. So in this case, it will be two, two, and one. And I'm using a plus operation again to combine maps, this meta map with this new map, which just contains the one key repeat count. Let's see what that looks like. Great. So we have a map with repeat count. I can see there are two repeat counts here, but further down repeat count one, we only have one. And you remember earlier that I said that the transpose operator was sort of like the inverse of the group tuple operator. So now to undo that work, oops, I'm gonna transpose this. Great. So now instead of our repeats being, uh, uh, together in the same element, I've split out the repeats, but note that the meta map has been retained so that I know that this row, even though it's repeat one, comes from a sample for which there were two repeats. And I know that these two fastq files, they were repeat one, they come from a sample that only had one repeat. So I'm going to pass this down through the meta maps so that it's available here when I select the group key. The last thing I'm going to do is I don't need these. Um, uh, I don't need to. I'm going to pull this repeat ID back into the meta map. So I'm going to take the meta map, which contains the meta, repeat, and reads, and combine these two. So now I'm just back to uh, two elements or two items in each element the meta map and then the reads. I'm going to call that samples. Let's just view that just so we see. Great. So now our metamap contains all the normal things, but now it has this extra element repeat count, which I'm going to use here when I'm setting the group key. So now. I can use this meta repeat count.
Perfect. So I've run the uh, group tuple operation, but now because I'm using this group key, those elements from group tuple will be emitted much faster than they would otherwise have been because I don't have to wait for all of the mapping operations to complete before my group tuple op starts, operator starts to emit items. The group tuple operator already knows that, for example, for some of these samples, it only has to wait for two samples, uh, for two of those repeats to be present before it can emit them. As soon as the repeat count, as soon as this second element in group key, the repeat count is satisfied, it's going to emit it immediately rather than having to wait for all of the samples. This is particularly useful for large runs where you have uh, dozens or even hundreds of samples, um, and you can start emitting those items downstream much faster as soon as possible. So now that we have our sort of BAMs together, we can do some more uh, fake bioinformatics. Again, this is just standing in place. We have a combined BAMs process, which takes a meta object and then a path to some BAM files, some input BAM files. And then we produce a combined .bam file. In this case, we just cap them together, but you can obviously imagine that in a real situation, you'd be using uh, proper tools to combine those BAM files. So now after the group tuple, we can run combine BAMs. Fantastic. So now we have our combined BAMs. So we have the SAMP metadata sample and then a BAM file, which can, which is the combination of all the repeats for the sample. So the previous approach uh, demonstrated, like the previous exercise demonstrated a fan-in approach uh, using group tuple and group key uh, for efficient fan-in, but we might want to fan out our processes. This is really common in invariant calling pipelines where you might want to, for example, call variants on each chromosome or over a, ser over a set of intervals. Uh, in this example, I have a intervals file. We have this uh, intervals.bed file. Let's see what it looks like. This is a dummy little bed file, which just has chromosomes. Uh, but let's say we wanted to fan out these. So now we have our combined BAM files. We've done our mapping operation. We've combined our repeats. We'd like to do some interval calling over each interval, each interval in parallel and then fan those back in later. Uh, using the previous exercise, uh, we can turn this into a channel of maps. So let's make a new channel. I'm gonna do it at the top. A new channel called intervals. So as before, we take a, a path, a bed file, and we use split CSV. Rather than header true, which we've used in the past because we know that our CSVs have had header files, this time we're specifying the headers manually. Bed files traditionally don't include headers. So I'm specifying that I expect this intervals.bed file to include one, two, three, four columns. And I'm just going to call them chromosome start, stop, name. I'm also specifying the separator as a tab character rather than a CSV, which is the default. Um, I'm going to collect, use the collect file operator. Actually, let's just see what that returns us. I'm using a, a little shortcut here, a little cheat. I'm calling return here so that everything downstream of this is not, uh, not evaluated. Great. So after split CSV, it returns us these, a channel with three elements, three maps. After that, I'm going to call collect file, and I'm going to make a new uh, entry, a new file uh, for each entry. So the collect file operator can take a closure. It takes an input, and it I'm going to return a list of two elements. The first element in this list is the name of the file that I'd like to collect into elements that come through this uh, closure that share the same fi output file name will be collected in one file together. 
Um, and then the second element is what I'd like to collect into that file. In this case, we're calling entry.value. So we're pulling out the values from each of these uh, uh, map uh, key value pairs. So it'll be crew one, zero, 11, and interval one. And we're joining them with tabs. So that is returned as three files, which look like this. The first interval, the second interval, and then the third interval. And we're going to give that collection of files, that channel of files, a name called intervals. Let's have a dummy genotyping process. Just as before, we're not actually doing genotyping just because we want to demonstrate that we're splitting and merging rather than actual bioinformatics. We don't want to wait for real tools. So we're going to call this genotype on intervals process, which takes a meta object, bam, and then a bed file maybe a bed file of intervals, and does some fake genotyping on that. So from here, after combine BAMs, what we're going to do is we're going to combine this with the intervals file. Let's just see what that looks like. Combine operation is like, it takes each input element um, and then attach, uh, emits a new element with that multiplied by all the obvious bed files. So for each input, now we have three elements being emitted to the channel. One for interval one, one for interval two, and one for interval three. That allows us to calculate the, uh, the genotyping in parallel on each of these intervals. So now we can pipe this in. Now this process, uh, this uh, channel, emits items that are the right shape, the right cardinality for the genotype on interval process. That is, it has a metamap, a BAM, and a bed file, a metamap, a BAM, and a bed file. So I can now pipe that into genotype on intervals. The last thing I'm going to do actually before I uh, after this group tuple operation, I'm just going to remind us what it, this looks like. Here we're viewing the operation. And here, this map, if you'll remember, this is actually. So it was a meta map and then um, BAM files. If we get the class of this, remember here that we have this group key operation. We've used this group key to group tuple here, but now we don't, we sort of want to do away with that group key. Uh, so what we're going to do remove the group key. So we have this and we have um, BAMs and I'm gonna instead, instead of return the group key, I'm gonna return the group key dot, um, this will remove the, um, the BAM just to make sure. We should just have our straight, uh, straight matter object back. Hopefully, we should see this a linked hash map. Whereas, if we look at that before we map and pull out the get group target, we should see a group key class. Great. So now we can, uh, after we've group tupled um, using that group key, we can dispose of the group key by calling this get group target, which returns the inner map, meta map. Pass that through combined BAMs. We're going to combine it with intervals and then the genotype and all of those intervals in parallel. Um, now we have a, let's say we have our merge genotypes. So we have some BCF files. 
Um, or we have some genotype BAMs, for example. Let's say we want to merge those now. Um, we have, can make a merge genotype process, which takes the meta object, uh, some BAM files, and again, just does some fake merging operations. We look at this, what's returned from the genotype on intervals. We have lots of, uh, lots of these BAM files. Uh, one, one entry per sample per uh, interval from our BAM file. Now pass that through the merge genotype because the cardinality matches. We're expecting a BAM. Uh, rather, we need to group tuple. Instead of this group target, we could also, as I've shown here, use meta.submap. Um, that's also totally fine. Another way of getting out the uh, returning a map instead of the group key. So we're combining on intervals, we're calling it genotype on intervals, we're going to group tuple and merge those genotypes together. Fantastic. And now we have our merged, uh, merged genotypes. So in this operation, we've done some complicated work here. We have taken our samples, we have um, uh, taken our samples, we have grouped all of the repeats together. And we've done this in a way that's very efficient by using the group key. Before using the group T, we've encoded the number of repeats early on in the process and passed that meta down, metadata down through the MapReads process so that it'd be available here for group tuple. So now we've grouped um, our repeats together. We've combined them all, combined the repeats into single BAM files per sample. Um, we've removed here the group key element, and then we've combined this over the intervals channel. So now we have three BAM files, uh, three elements uh, per BAM file, one with each uh, interval from our bed file. We've genotyped over each of those intervals in parallel, and then grouped the tuple back. So we've grouped back by the meta map and we've merged genotypes um, and then viewed the outputs here. So we've done some complicated branching, splitting and merging. And I hope this gives you an idea about our sort of taste and sort of strategy about how you too might implement uh, efficient grouping and splitting in your next load workflows. Perfect. We'll see you in the next one. That concludes the content for this first chunk of the workshop. So for the next uh, hour or so, uh, we're going to leave this open for Q&A. So um, feel free to drop by the CEP23 advanced training channel on the NF Core Slack, um, and we can discuss anything that you've uh, has come up over the content that we've presented so far, or any questions or concerns, or general Nextflow uh, and NF Core queries. We look forward to seeing you in Slack. See you soon.